What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. If you're checking us out, through your ears on iPhone, Spotify, or Google Pods. Welcome in. Thanks for checking out the audio today. I know we always have so many great podcast listeners. I urge you, leave us a detailed review and give me five stars. Let me know what you think of the show. We have, I think, over 1,500 reviews on iTunes, many on Spotify, and I thank you for those. Your participation means everything to me. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? We are back with another episode of the sit down. This is episode 109. I am your host, Jeff Nato. And as always, we are presented by Bar Stool Sports. And you know what? Tuesdays with video and Wednesdays with audio means it's time for another weekly show. And today, I'm going to get into a show that I am supremely excited about. I'm so interested in. I think one of the more interesting families we don't talk enough about is the DeCalvacanti crime family in New Jersey. As many have heard the name DeCalvacanti, they know the connections. Are they the real Sopranos? Today we're going to get into one of the more colorful people ever associated with that family, Vinny Ocean Palermo. We'll get to that in just a second. I have to admit, guys, I did some tireless research on this show. In fact, I actually believe I spoke to Vinny on the phone. He wasn't very receptive from the person that I believe I spoke to. But again, we'll keep moving on and we'll give you a great show here. He's definitely still around. Uh, He's definitely resurfaced and he has a wild life. We'll talk about all that more in just a second. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you all about FitBod. FitBod is something that I think if you're looking to lose weight, take your workout to the next level, I think you have to get the FitBod app. Now, as someone who has a ton of experience losing weight, as many of you know, or if you don't know, I lost 140 pounds since mid-2020. And for me, there were many things that went into it, obviously diet and exercise, but FitBod was important as well because what it did is it created a workout program that really personalized what I wanted to do, the fitness level that I was on, and what equipment I had. And I've been very open to say that I never went to a gym. You know, I never had a Peloton. I just kind of, you know, grabbed a workout that worked for me and adapted to it. And that's exactly what it was FitBot allowed me to do. It was a great companion to me to really crush fitness goals. And whether it's you're trying to lose weight, get right for summer, or just improve on what you're already doing, FitBod's for you. I think it's just something you have to have. You can build a workout plan that's individualized to you. You can switch up exercise to avoid overtraining or burnout and keeps everything fun. I think that's one problem sometimes at workouts is they become monotonous. You got to make them fun. You got to make them easy. And FitBod allows you to do that. Learn new movements the right way with over 1,400 demonstration videos, and also allows changes based on your personal progress for maximized results. What I'm going to do for you right now, just by listening, viewing this show, a full year of FitBot is less than the cost of a single session with a personal trainer. Think about that. Think about how much personal trainers cost. Think how much gyms cost. FitBot you can get essentially for significantly less than you'd pay any personal trainer. Just by listening to this show, There's no better time to level up with your fitness habit. You need to go try FitBod right now. You can try the app free and get 25% off your subscription by using my special code, fitbod.me slash sit down. Again, that's fitbod.me slash sit down. F-I-T-B-O-D dot M-E slash sit down. You're going to get yourself 20% off. Go download the app. Get yourself a subscription. 25% off. Fitbot.me slash sit down. You got to crush your fitness goals. I have. You need to, too. Get yourself in shape. Get yourself healthy. and Take care of your body right now. 
with FitBod. All right, everybody, without further ado, let's get in to the show this week. One that I can't wait for. It's Vincent Vinny Ocean Palermo next on the sit down. Vincent Palermo was born in 1945 in the Brooklyn enclave of Bensonhurst. Now, we would find that out, at least to me, through a more unlikely source. In the testimony of Joey Messino, of all people, the Bonanno a boss who would decide to defect against his family, he would say that it was well known that Vincent Palermo was actually from the same area that Anthony Spira was from, and that Vincent and his brother Pasquale were known throughout Brooklyn. Now, Vinny Palermo grew up in a pretty normal and typical home. In fact, his childhood was quite similar to any other Italian family in Brooklyn for the most part. He grew up in a strict Catholic household, something that he hold dear to his uh, self uh, throughout his life. Vincent Palermo's family, though, sadly, his mother and father had health issues. Uh, his mother was asthmatic, and for most of his childhood, it was actually bedridden. So think about that. You know, most people grow up and they have their mom, you know, cooking and taking care of them. It was hard for Vinny Ocean's mom to take care of him because she had health problems. At the age of 16 in the late 50s, Vinny Ocean's father would actually die. Uh, and this would further exacerbate the problems that Vinny Ocean and his family had. They were a pretty large family. And Vinny and his brother realized that they were going to quickly have to kind of produce uh, for their sisters and for their mom. By the late 60s, or by the early 60s, Vinny Ocean would actually get a job at the Fulton Fish Market. He would begin kind of working at different stands. And this was obviously to help him and his family uh, be supported. But this is also where Vinny Ocean really got his start in business. One thing that I would find about Vinny Ocean is, like most mobsters, they're very business-minded. When it came to being what Vinny Ocean ultimately became, it's no surprise that he became the boss of the family because he has had something we've talked about time and time again on my show. To become a truly transcendent gangster, boss material, you have to not only be able to hurt people, but you have to be able to make money. And Vinny Ocean realized like by his late teens that he could make money, whether it was legitimate or illegitimate. And this has been said many times by gangsters themselves and whoever. When you're associated with the mob, you have to have a certain level of ability to just do what you have to do to make money. You can't have a conscience. You can't have ethics or morals. You have to take what you have. So if you find out a woman has 20K under her bed, you have to be willing to go and take it. You know, um, you have to have that mindset. And Vinny Ocean had that mindset and he learned it very quickly business wise at the Fulton Fish Market. Now, eventually, Vinny Ocean would actually buy into a fish shop in Brooklyn called Ocean Fish, which he would actually buy for just $4,000 in the 60s. Now, the interesting thing, again, business mind, in 1993, Vinny Ocean would sell that same fish shop for about $700,000. So he had a very nice profit, all for the most part tax-free. This is the kind of stuff that makes pretty rich people very rich. So buying into business is cheap, selling them later for a lot of money. Now, as I said, Joey Messino in his testimony talked about so many different people, but there were some interesting things we would find out about Vinny Ocean and his brother. So Vinny Ocean had a brother called Pasquale Palermo. They called him Patsy. Some people called him Junior. We would also learn from a Colombo crime family informant called Big Sal Michiata that Junior Palermo was a guy that took a little bit different track in the mafia than his brother, Vincent. Uh, it was well known. And this is something that is actually well known to mobsters, but it's not real well known to the public that not only was Vinny Ocean a made man in the mafia, but his brother Pasquale was actually a made member in the mafia as well. Pasquale Palermo would get his start as a charter member in the old bypass gang in the seventies. Now, the Bypass Gang was a highly effective burglary ring 
that had Lucchese and Colombo crime family people in it. People like Anthony Casso, we all know about his involvement in the bypass gang. These guys were able to make off with hundreds of millions of stolen goods and were able to bypass locks and all sorts of different other things to get what they wanted. It was said that one of the original members of the bypass gang was Vinny Ocean's brother, Junior Palermo. Now, Junior Palermo, when he became a made member, he was actually made, according to Joe Messino, the same day Joey Messino was made. The difference between Pasquale and Joe Messino was Joey was in Bonanos. Pasquale was a made member in the Colombo crime family. He would eventually go into the crew of Charles Charlie Moose Panarella. According to Big Sal Michiata, he would say that Junior Palermo was, quote, a tough, low-key guy. And he made a lot of money with the bypass gang. For Vinny Ocean, while his brother was doing his thing in the bypass gang, Vinny Ocean was involved with the fish business. He said he would at one point steal whatever he could, whether it was fish, shrimp, whatever. Uh, and look, as we know with the Fulton fish market, as we know with running businesses, that also leads to hijacking, extortion. And that's what Vinny Ocean was doing. He was making legitimate money, but he was also making money through, uh, you know, illegitimate activity as well. Gambling, bookmaking, extortion, whatever you have to do. And what you're also starting to do is get the eye of different gangsters. In the 60s, Vinny Ocean, as many men do, they meet a good woman. And that's exactly what Vinny Ocean did. He would ultimately meet a woman with the last name of Ochapinti. Now, Robert Ochapinti, her father, was a made member of the DeCavacanti crime family in New Jersey. He was actually the cousin of Simone Sam the Plumber DeCavacanti, the namesake of the family. They were based in New Jersey. So Vinny Ocean starts hanging around his father-in-law starts hanging around Sam the Plumber. Sam the Plumber had a social club in Kenilworth, New Jersey, and they were making loads of money. In fact, if you know anything about Robert Bobby Basile Ochapinti, he was huge in the real estate markets. Um, according to the great site, NewYorkMafia.com, they would kind of outline his involvement in all sorts of different housing uh, developments, complexes, projects in New Jersey. He was a big earner. and his cousin, his blood ties, made it very easy for not only him to move around, but his son-in-law. And ultimately, Vinny Ocean becomes pretty close to Sam the Plumber. Sam the Plumber knew who he was. Things were going good for Vinny Ocean. He was making a very good living, um, not only illegitimately, but legitimately. Um, and by the mid-70s, he's started to impress people enough where Ochapinti per poses him for membership in the DeCalvacanti crime family. This is one thing also we would learn about the DeCalvacantis is that most of their members, whether it was um, you know Brooklyn or wherever, they had a large presence in New Jersey, and a lot of them were coming into New Jersey and making money. Now, when you look at the DeCalvacanti family, Simone DeCalvacanti was from you know Elizabeth, North Jersey. John D'Amato was from North Jersey. John Riggy was from North Jersey. When we look at some of the other high ca high ranking capos, Vinny Rotondo, Vinny Ocean down the road, these guys are from New York. So there was a strict involvement of New Yorkers as well in the DeCalvacanti crime family. Vinny Ocean Palermo would become a made member in spring of 1977 in the DeCalvacanti crime family. And I want to kind of go through uh, the night that he was a made member. Now, keep in mind, you know, the 70s were kind of an interesting time for a lot of families. When we start started seeing kind of a wave of membership uh, in the 70s. In 1976, people like uh, Vincent Rotondo were made, Larry Shiro, Stefano Vitabile, they were all made. In 77, Vinny Ocean is a made member. But keep in mind, at that point, he's you know 31 years old. He's a young guy. And he would be sponsored by his father-in-law, uh, Bobby Basile Ochapente. Now, Palermo would say, um, this is an excerpt from down the road, him talking about his making ceremony. He would say that he met with his father-in-law and they would ultimately meet Steve, the truck driver, Vita Bile, at a diner on Bay Street. 
uh, in Brooklyn. They would follow him uh, to a home in Elizabeth, New Jersey. We would park a block or two away. We walked to the house and walked to the side of the basement. They would then walk into the basement uh, and there was a location and people would be met elsewhere and they'd bring him in there. So no one knew where the spot was. So you were kind of, it was kind of a secret location. According to Palermo, there were several guys that made got made that night alongside of me. There were three or four of us. At the ceremony, Sam DeCavacante was there as the boss. John Riggi was there as well, the underboss, as well as the consigliere, uh, Steve, the truck driver, and several other captains. They all got up and told me to stay sitting down. They would hold hands, which they called a chain which means whatever's discussed in that administration meeting can't be discussed outside of the basement. Sam would then speak to us and say, do you like all these people here? Would you like to be a part of that group that we have? If you ever need help, we're here from you, here for you. If you have a problem, it's our problem. Vinny Ocean would also say, if you're asked to do anything that we ask you to do, you need to take care of it and do it. He just more or less went over minor rules and then said, do you all agree? To which we said, yes, we do want to be a part of the people that are here. They then spoke to us and made us wise guys. He would also say that DeCalvacanti went over the normal stuff, quote, there's no drugs. You can't go out with anybody's wife. That's a friend of ours. And there's no setting bombs off anywhere because you don't want to hurt innocent people. He would then say that there was a gun and knife present and that these are the tools you live by. You go in with a gun and you go out with a gun. He would also say that there are tools like carpenters that have hammers and screwdrivers. These are our tools, a gun and a knife. He would end with saying, you're in the family. You go around, shake everybody's hand and kiss them around the table and they introduce you. So Vinny Ocean uh, discussed that the ceremony was pretty normal to the ones that we hear about. He would also say, though, one other pretty interesting point. He would say that in the regular ceremony, they did not pinch his finger the first time, which was kind of interesting because we would find out years later that in the 80s when DeCalvacanti was long gone, John Riggi was in prison, certain members of the family started doing business with John Gotti. And John Gotti essentially had control over the DeCalvacanti crime family for a period of time. In the late 80s, Vinny Ocean would actually have to be re-inducted due to the fact that he wasn't someone that had his finger pricked. He was alongside about seven or eight others that had the same situation. So that was kind of an interesting point. Why they didn't use the knife that night, I don't know. Why they didn't draw blood, I don't know. Uh, That could have just been something uh, that was just random. Ultimately, Vinny Ocean was assigned to the crew of Vincent Jimmy Rotondo. Jimmy Rotondo was an old school Brooklyn capo in the DeCalvacanti crime family. He had a lot of sway over the Brooklyn waterfront. Now, the reason he was putting Jimmy Rotondo's crew was due to the fact that he could not be involved with relatives and things like that. So they put him in the crew of Vincent Jimmy Rotondo, them being both from Brooklyn. So things are really working out for Vinny Ocean. And remember, I I don't think I need to say this, but I will. People will ask, why did Vincent Palermo get the name Vinny Ocean? Well, it goes back to his days associated with the Fulton Fish Market and the fact that he had the Ocean Fish Company. So Vincent, Vinny Ocean, makes sense. I actually think that's actually one of the doper nicknames. I love that nickname, to be honest. Um, Now, by 1978, I mentioned that Vinny Ocean's brother was also associated with the mafia and the Colombo crime family. Vinny Ocean would first be called upon to commit a murder in 1978. Quite interesting because by this point he was already made. A lot of that had to do with the fact of his connections to Bobby Basile and Sam DeCavacanti, but also with the fact that he was a business minded earner. But he would have called to be called upon to take part in a murder finally. And this one was actually pretty close to home. In 1978, an issue would develop in Vinnie Palermo's family. At the time, his mother, who I mentioned had health problems, she had multiple brothers, one of which her brother, John Sporato, was involved with the Gambino crime family. So Vinnie Ocean's uncle um, was uh, 
involved with the Gambinos. He was a, a bookmaker and he was doing a lot of things. Another brother in Vinny Ocean's mother's family dies. He has an inheritance. He leaves most of his inheritance to his sister, Vinny Ocean's mom. Vinny Ocean's brother, or Vinny Ocean's uncle, which is her brother, is incensed by this. He believes that he should get most of the money, not her. He's left with like a small amount and he's incensed. So instead of trying to work it out with his family, Vinny Ocean's uncle, John Suarado, shoots up a home and attempts to throw acid on children in Vinny Ocean's family, which is a big problem. Instead of trying to work it out through friends of ours, he goes off the deep end, this guy, John Suarado. Vinny Ocean goes to his brother and they basically agree that we have to deal with this. And in July of 1978, after the shooting up of the home and the acid, Charles Moose Panarello, which was Vinny Ocean's brother's captain, decides that they're going to keep this close to home and they're going to off John Suarado. They go to members of the DeCalvacanti crime family. John Riggi essentially says, we need not only Patsy Palermo, but we also need Vinny Ocean on this. So Vinny Ocean and Patsy, the neat nephews, were the trigger men on this hit. And Palermo would admit to this later in life. The driver that day, and this is how we know this, the driver that day was another Panarella crew member, Dom Soma. Soma was uh, the, the guy who picked them up that day uh, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. So the first hit that Vinny Ocean would commit was his uncle, John Suarado. So look, we can admit, I mean, there's a lot of murders that probably shouldn't happen, but John Suarado seemed like a scumbag uh, in some of the things that he did. So we'd have to say that Vinny Ocean was probably... Uh, well regarded after doing that. So by the late seventies, early eighties, let's kind of backtrack. Vinny Ocean has committed a murder. He's a made member. He's making a lot of money. He's got kids. He's married. Everything's good for him. Making a lot of money. And again, it's not just illegitimate. It's also legitimate. By the eighties, Vinny Ocean's has strip clubs, a gambling boat, car dealerships, and one of the really kind of insightful comments that Vinny Ocean made in his career was he was never against any kind of money, right? So he wasn't just one of these people that said, I'm only going to go after big scores. Vinny Ocean had the mindset of he was going to get whatever he could out of anybody. So, for instance, at one point, Vinny Ocean's ran a strip club on queens boulevard in queens called wiggles and he would say at one point that he found out that one of the strippers at wiggles uh was in possession of about twenty five thousand dollars according to vinnie ocean he would say at one point quote when she was dancing i went to her apartment and stole the money so he really had no pension. He would steal whatever he could get his hands on. So he wasn't too good for certain things. He had the mindset of, I'm going to steal. I'm going to extort. I'm going to book make. I'm going to give loan. I'm going to make millions. And this is no secret to why by the 90s, Vinny Ocean is a very rich man. And we'll get into some of his uh, other successes. Now, around Vinny Ocean, he had several people that were pretty integral to his day-to-day. Uh, one of them was uh, Joseph Joey O. Masella. Masella was ultimately a problem. The problem that Joe Masella had was he was a major gambler. Um, and the problem for addicted people is they start cutting into legitimate business, start stealing. You know, At one point, it was quoted that Joe Masella owned owed about four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars to various bookmakers and this down the road would become a major embarrassment to Vinny ocean other associates of Vinny ocean were anthony capo and james gallo now i want to kind of get into kind of the important parts of kind of the late 80s early 90s which were 
kind of wild times in the Cavacanti crime family. Before we do that, though, I do want to discuss the ultimate end and sad demise for Vinny Ocean's brother, Pasquale Palermo. In 1984, he would die of a heart attack um, in his 40s. He was a pretty young guy. Now, Big Sal Michiata, who knew Vinny Ocean's brother pretty well, would say that once he started really becoming involved with the Bypass Gang in the late 70s, early 80s, he began to live a more fast life. We also know, and it's actually well regarded, that at one point Anthony Casso was a coke addict. It would become pretty clear that Palermo's brother Pasquale had a coke problem as well. He started living fast and just kind of crapped out. So in 1984, his brother would die. And we're unclear of how that affected him. But, um, you know, as his only brother, that was probably tough on him. Now, as I said, by the late 80s, there's kind of a power struggle in the Decavacanti. There's a lot of territory in New Jersey. We always know that the five families, whether it's Lucchese or the Genovese or the Gambinos, they always have had involvement in New Jersey. But you also have this other family that does not not answer to you. They're their own family, right? Which is always kind of interesting because we think when we, when we saw the Sopranos, for instance, at one point they would call the Soprano crew a pygmy thing over in Jersey. I don't know if that's how the five families actually looked at the Calvacantes because they all had presences of their own in the state. But for the most part, they worked pretty much kind of in hand there was never like a war between them or anything but the family was undergoing issues because by this point the boss of the family is john the eagle riggy by the late 80s he starts having issues with um the federal government he starts to have to realize that you know an indictment's going to come down before that though it was actually well regarded that john the eagle riggy and john Gotti. Uh, were actually pretty close. They had an okay relationship. During this time, John Gotti and the Calvacanti family are doing business with a person called Fred Weiss. Fred Weiss is a former editor for the Staten Island Advance. He was a real estate developer. He starts becoming involved with the legal dumping, which is something the Gambinos were involved in. And at one point, Fred Weiss was under thought that he was going to get indicted, but he would say that it was, quote, nothing to worry about. And this got back to Gotti. So Gotti starts worrying that Fred Weiss isn't a gangster. Maybe he's going to testify. So they put a hit out on Fred Weiss. Ultimately, John the Eager Riggy kind of does it as a favor. And Vinny Ocean, Jimmy Gallo, and Anthony Capo ultimately stalk Fred Weiss to a condominium in New Jersey and kill him. Now, down the road, we would find out that there was also another hit team assembled involving Joe Watts and other people. And I talked about that when I talked about Joe Watts and the video can be seen here. Um, So there were two hit teams set up because Fred Weiss had two different locations. The location that ultimately was where Fred Weiss was, the New Jersey crew took care of. So that's another murder that Ocean is directly involved in. And this is where the power struggle kind of starts because John the Eagle Riggy, eventually gets indicted, and he has to realize that he is going to have to put someone in control. Ultimately for him, he decides to go to a guy who we've also talked about before uh, in a previous episode, a guy called Gaetano Corky Vistola. Corky was at one point running dice games, Um, He was actually very involved at one point with the music business. He was a concert promoter, ended up becoming uh, involved with roulette records. He was very involved with the music business at one point. Um, He does some time in jail. It's become pretty evident at one point. John Gotti did some time with him and, quote, hated Vistola. um, And that at one point he would become some sort of cooperator. At this time, Gotti's doing business as well with a guy called John D'Amato, who was very close with John Riggy as well. D'Amato was always kind of an errand boy lapdog to John Gotti. At one point, Gotti and D'Amato are discussing a plan to kill Corky. Because, look, again, and, and I've talked about this before, 
John Gotti was a lot smarter than we give him credit for in various situations. John Gotti realized John Riggie's in jail. He's not going to be able to do anything. And if I can weave a web around John D'Amato and get him to kill Vistola, I will essentially run New Jersey because he'll do what I say. Another very smart, savvy move by Gotti. He gets, Vest, you know, Vistola. He already hated him anyway. So he gets D'Amato kind of wrapped around his finger. At one point, Gotti would say to D'Amato, quote, I don't know if he's a rat now, but he's going to be a rat someday. Which D'Amato would respond, yeah, that's the way I feel about him. So again, constant lapdogging for Gotti. Because look, D'Amato wasn't dumb either. D'Amato was a construction tycoon. He made a lot of money, was very respected. He knew that an involvement with Gotti would be good for his wallet as well, and that it would strengthen the family. So the goal was, we're going to kill Corky Vistola. There's a plot to kill him, but it never actually happens. But this would be a conspiracy that John Gotti would face down the road. The conspiracy never happens because Corky Vistola gets indicted uh, by the FBI uh, and ultimately uh, goes to prison, which was good because he didn't ever face death. Uh, he would be sent this to 20 years in prison um, and would get out in 1998. But this would kind of sow the seeds for the next boss. Because from prison, Riggy sees that Vistola's off the street. He needs to put a boss in there. It works out perfectly for John Gotti because John D'Amato, Riggy's old protege, is named acting boss of the DeCalvacanti crime family. By this point, things are starting to work well for the DeCalvacantis. They're making more money. But now they're under really the John Gotti umbrella. This was the first time this had really happened. We have to get, though, to briefly discussing what would ultimately happen with John D'Amato. Because I'm kind of going through a history of the DeCalvacantes, and we'll all circle back to Vinny Ocean because he's integral in all of this. John D'Amato is the boss by, like, early 1990. By 1991, this is where the embarrassment starts coming for the the Calvacanti crime family. And this would be portrayed in The Sopranos as well. One of the things that you'll find about the stories of the DeCalvacantis in the 80s, 90s, they're all reminiscent of storylines you would see in Sopranos. And at the end of the show, I'll talk about, I think, some of the inspirations because many people will say that the inspiration for Tony Soprano is of Vinny Ocean. I don't believe that. I'll talk about that later. But the John D'Amato storyline is in The Sopranos as well. In 1991, John D'Amato has a girlfriend. John Amato, D'Amato is going out with her, hanging out with her. At one point, it's alleged they start going to sex clubs in Manhattan. They get into some sort of fight. John D'Amato's girlfriend runs to members of the DeCalvacanti crime family people like Anthony Rotondo and other members of that family. She would tell members of the group that John D'Amato was actively bisexual and that he had engaged in sex acts with other men and her as well, which was a major indictment on John D'Amato. Now, in regular circles, your sexual proclivities are your own business, but when you're dealing with the mafia, that's a major no-no. Rotonda would then take the information to the underboss of the family, Jake Amari, and Consiglieri Stefano Vitable. At one point, the mafia would say, quote, nobody's going to respect us if we have a gay boss sitting down discussing La Cosa Nostra business. So this was a major problem. Okay, they needed to get rid of John D'Amato, but John D'Amato was very dialed into New York. He was very close to John Gotti. Um, ultimately, the ruling body, uh, including Vitabile and Amari, order John D'Amato's murder. And this would go back to Vinny Ocean. He, alongside Capo and other members, put the hit in motion, and D'Amato is taken out. John D'Amato's body was never found. So again, 
we have another power vacuum at the top while Riggy's in jail. Riggy's not getting out. So Riggy has to start, continue to put people in control. The D'Amato situation was a major problem for the Cavacantes, but they had to solve it the way they knew by killing him. And again, this would be a story portrayed in The Sopranos with Vito Spadafore, who liked D'Amato as a construction tycoon, new people in New York like Phil Leotardo. They consider maybe keeping him around because he can make money, but then they realize they can't ultimately do that. The story was a little different, but again, another story that kind of life imitates art. So again, another power vacuum after D'Amato's taken out. Riggy has to consider what he's going to do now. By this point, Vinny Ocean is named a capo of the old crew of Vincent Jimmy Rotonda, who was killed. So he takes over the crew. And he, but look, this is not a big family. By this point, Vinny Ocean becomes a very important member of this family because there is no boss on the street. So it's almost like a ruling panel, if you will. Um, by this point, he's a rich man. Vinny Ocean has a huge home uh, on uh, Long Island in an area called Island Park, which is a swanky area near Hempstead, Long Island. Uh, the boss at this time of the family is Jake Amari. He's elevated from underboss to boss. Vinny Ocean, early 92, you know, doing well. I want to talk about his family life. Vinny Ocean had his original wife who he would ultimately uh, you know, move on from. And he would remarry. Now, he would have three kids with his new wife, including two daughters and a son. And with his old wife, he had one daughter and one son. So he had several children. Um, now, the problem, again, by 1995 for the DeCalva Canty crime family was leadership because Riggy's in jail. The boss of the family, Jacob Mari, in his 50s, developed stomach cancer. By 1995, he becomes sick. And by 1997, he dies. So again, they have to insult, install new leadership. That's exactly what they do. But this time, it's not just one individual. A ruling panel is put up. Vinny Palermo, Gerolamo Palermo. Now, Gerolamo Palermo and Vinny Palermo are not related. They just happen to have the same name. Uh, and then Charles Big Ears, Missouri. They're kind of the ruling panel. Now, this is where a kind of inner war starts because Big Ears, Missouri, believes he should be the boss. And he's incensed and furious and decides, I don't want to be a ruling panel. I want to be the out-and-out boss of this family. So Missouri gets an idea. He says, well, you know, screw these guys. I'm going to kill Vinny Ocean and Jerry Palermo. The problem is, in the mafia, you have to get to them before they get to you. Vinny Ocean starts setting in motion plans to kill Missouri. Now, I want to fast forward back to Vinny Ocean's guy, Joey O. Masella. Vinny Ocean puts Joey O. in control of killing uh, Charles Majori. The problem that Vinny Ocean has is Joe Masella kind of gets cold feet. And by this point, Joe Masella was a real liability. He was an embarrassment for Vinny Ocean. He owed a lot of money to the other families for his gambling problems. From what I understand, he started um, kind of a sifting money off of different bookmaking operations he was supposed to be involved in. Um, he was a problem. He then essentially evacuates after he doesn't want to kill Majori. He flees to Florida, and he was a major problem. So this starts another problem for Vinny Ocean because he needs to kill Majori, but his people are starting to decide that they don't want to do things. So now Vinny Ocean says, I got to kill Masella as well. Now, ultimately, with Charles Majori, cooler heads prevail and no one's killed. Missouri's still around today, and many people believe he is the boss of the DeCavacanti crime family. He's very old. Um, but Vinny Ocean is presented with new problems. He's presented with the problem of twofold. A, Masella needs to go. He's one of my closest people. 
And the government's starting to, you know, kind of understand who Vinny Ocean is. Vinny Ocean's a really rich guy. I mean, he has all sorts of businesses, car dealerships and car washes and restaurants and strip clubs. He's a strip club king. You know, he's on the surface and the radar of the feds. And that's another problem. He, though, realizes that he has to kill Masella. Masella is stalked to a Brooklyn parking lot where he is whacked uh, in the late 90s. Now, ultimately, we never found out who actually killed Masella. There was different reports. Some people believed it was a person called Ronald Greco. The charges would ultimately be dropped against Ronald Greco. Some people felt that it was Wesley Palacio. Palacio was a low-level gambler. Um, he had been involved with Joey O in a bookmaking ring, which Joey O was scamming money off of. No one actually knows who killed Joey O. Masella, um, but this would be another murder that Vinny Ocean is tied to. Another problem would come to Vinny Ocean as well. In 1998, there would be a robbery at the World Trade Center, one World Trade Center in January of 1998. Bank robbers would make off with about $1.6 million in cash. Essentially, a Briggs van would pull up to the World Trade Center about 8.30 and begin unloading uh, about $1.6 million. Today, that'd be worth almost $3 million. Um, multiple members, uh, including a person called Ralph Guarino, as well as a person called Richie Gillette, would rob the Brinks truck. Now, in the aftermath of that, Garino had to get rid of the money and kind of launder it. Problem was, Ralph Garino was tied to the Cavacanti crime family, and he's picked up by the FBI. And as customary, Ralph Garino doesn't want to go to prison. He starts wearing a wire. Long story short, Ralph Garino has this big robbery. People propose him for membership. Feds pull him off the street. And this would ultimately be a big problem for Vinny Ocean because what Ralph Garino did is wear a wire. He starts wiretapping all these people and the feds have enough on Vinny Ocean. In December of 1999, Vincent Vinny Ocean Palermo, alongside 14 other members of various families, are indicted on charges ranging from racketeering, extortion, gambling, and murder conspiracies. Vinny Ocean would come to a real fork in the road. He had made millions of dollars. By this point, he was the de facto head of the Cavacanti crime family. Because remember, Missouri kind of got the picture. John Riggie's well off the street. Jacob Mari's dead. Vinny Ocean's the de facto boss of the family. But he was under the eye, wide eyes of the government. He's indicted. He starts realizing that I don't have one, I have not two, I have multiple bodies on me. Remember, Vinny Ocean has um, Fred Weiss killing his uncle. At one point, um, he had killed another guy, Lou LaRassa. At one point, it was uh, thought that he had tried to kill the manager of his strip club, Wiggles. Um, there were all sorts of conspiracies. The feds would contend that there were up to 10 murders that he was either involved in or planned and tried to conspire to do. Vinny Ocean faced a death penalty. He had to realize that. It was done. Game over. But not for Vinny Ocean. He would decide very quickly that he was going to flip. He would confess to killing his uncle, Fred Weiss, as well as planning many other murders, you know, Everything he had ever did. We know what happens when a mobster decides to flip. They give up all their crimes. The extortion, the gambling, the loan sharking, the robberies, the everything he's done in his career, the murders. And what does this do? This starts a domino effect, just like every other family. What did we see in the bananas? One flips, and then we start seeing many flip. Other people would start to flip, including Anthony Capo as well, one of Vinny Ocean's most trusted underlings. And the goal of the federal government by this point is to get 
the boss off the street, which they did by flipping him. Capo's off the street. And they wanted to go after the old school guys in this family, including Stefano Vitabile, Pino Schlafliti, Philip Abramo. They, they wanted to take the high-ranking leadership and old school guys of the De Calvacanti crime family off the street. Now, as I said, this indictment happens in late 1999. And that cooperation occurs in the 2000s. Remember the date and year 1999. That was a synonymous date because the Sopranos would debut in early 1999. And I just want to go over some of the interesting correlations with the actual real show and the real people. And then we'll get into Vinny Ocean today, which I have some pretty interesting details on. I do want to discuss kind of the thoughts of gangsters on the street uh, with the Sopranos. Um, it's said that some of Tony Soprano was taken from Vinny Ocean. Now, David Chase, the creator of the Sopranos, has said that no one character is based off any real people, or if they are, there are several people. Now, there are others that I believe Tony Soprano is made off of, including Michael Tachetta. Richie Boy Boyardo, obviously the you know strip club stuff kind of is an ode to Vinny Ocean. Do I think he's the real life inspiration? No, I think he could be some of it. But this is what we learn in a lot of the characters in The Sopranos. Like if you look at Jackie April, he's very much based off Jake Amari, who also died in his fifties from cancer. You know, if you look at Vito, he's based off some like there's all sorts of different characters that you see some of the stories in the show based off of real life. At one point, a member of the DeCalvacanti crime family would talk openly about the Sopranos, a guy called Joe Sclafani. He would say at one point about the Sopranos, what's this fucking thing, Sopranos? Is that supposed to be us? To which Another member would say, what characters, though? Great acting. So I guess we think that most of them watched the show and thought, you know, this was us, and they're probably doing a pretty good job of it. Just kind of an interesting correlation. Vinny Ocean would ultimately do about two years in federal prison, and he would uh, be released sometime around 2002. Um, now, I do want to go through an interesting portion of his testimony. At one point, the federal government actually considered ripping up his cooperation agreement after it became clear that Vinny Ocean would transfer about $1.75 million in cash to one of his sons, Michael Palermo. At that point, Vinny Ocean's son, Michael, was an investment banker at Goldman Sachs. And the feds would claim that the profits had actually come from strip club proceeds. And they were absolutely furious that he did not tell the feds that he did that. And they had, again, considered ripping up his cooperation agreement. So this was kind of a problem for a Vinny Ocean. He would say that he handed over the cash in a suitcase as a gift to look after his family because he, quote, knew he was going to go to jail for a long time. Um, so this was kind of a problem. They didn't ultimately rip it up, but this could have been a problem for Vinny Ocean. Once his testimony is given up, and I will admit all the high ranking members for the most part, uh, in the mafia, in the DeCalvacanti crime family would go to, uh, prison. Um, you look at, uh, Abramo, uh, Vitabile and, uh, Pino, they all went to prison and got life. Um, I think at one point, Chad Marks and I talked about Pino. Um, he was in one of the prisons with Chad Marks or Robert Rosso, one of those two. But uh, things worked. Uh, the feds got what they wanted out of Vinny Ocean and Anthony Capo and Rotondo and all those guys that flipped. Vinny Ocean would vanish. We wouldn't hear from him for a while. He would though turn up in 2009 in a bit of a bizarre uh, kind of turn of events. Um, in 2009, uh, 
a story in a newspaper in Houston, Texas, uh, of all places, would turn up about a person called Vincent Cabela. We would find out that Vincent Cabela was actually Vincent Vinny Ocean Palermo. And guess what Vinny Ocean was up to in Houston? He was running strip clubs. And all of it afforded Vinny Ocean to still become a very rich man. He lived in this palatial monstrosity at 9105 Memorial in Houston, Texas. And it was equipped with marble and five and a half baths, five and a half bedrooms, like all sorts of beautiful pools. And it, it just was a beautiful place, uh, columns and everything. We would find out that Vinny Ocean was the proprietor of not one but two strip clubs, one of which was called the Penthouse Club, another spot called All-Stars Cabaret. Now, he was also in control of a Mexican restaurant called Ruchi's, as well as a car wash called the Super Clean Car Wash. Now, this gentleman's club today is called Vivid Gentleman's Club, and it is all, all of these businesses that Vinny Ocean allegedly ran or runs are all in the same area of an area called Midwest uh, in Houston. Now, I do want to discuss some of the things that Vinny Ocean had to deal with uh, at one point uh, in uh, the 2000s. The Fed, or not the Fed, but local police in Houston uh, were starting to find out that they believed that the strip clubs that Vinny Ocean was running as a rat, uh, were seedy. In fact, they believed there were sources of not only drug dealing, but prosecution. And they started sending in uh, undercovers, and they believed that all the locations were uh, problem areas. And actually, at one point, we even shut down uh, the Penthouse Club for over a year uh, due to some of the issues. Uh, Vinny Ocean has had all sorts of problems in his uh, today life. Um, he would at one point actually attempt to sell a 9105 Memorial Drive. He would put the house up for sale in 2009 after the newspaper articles would come out on him. He wouldn't sell it and would take it off the market by 2011. In 2015, he would place the house up for sale again, and the home would ultimately sell for $2.85 million dollars in 2016. Now, we fast forward to Vinny Ocean. Uh, in 2013, Vinny Ocean would file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now, according to public files, there are multiple tax liens on multiple properties today that Vinny Ocean Palermo runs. I do want to make this clear. Vinny Ocean still, from what I understand, lives in a suburb of Houston, Texas called Katy. Now, I did do a little digging on some of the strip clubs today. The old penthouse club is still a strip club. It is called Vivid Gentlemen's Club. Now, weirdly enough, in 2020, it would turn up in an article written by Outkick.com. During the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, Vivid Gentlemen's Club would gain national notoriety after they became the first outdoor drive through strip club, cars would drive through and dancers naked, you know, behind walls would wear masks and dance for people. And all sorts of outlets picked it up and did it. Now, I called Vivid Gentlemen's Club and asked for the owner, and I was told that he wasn't there. Now, from what I understand, and in public filings, all of these businesses are still around. Now, Vinny Ocean at one point would create an incorporated called Here We Are Again. Now, the line of businesses under that were the Penthouse Club, the Car Wash, Rucci's, the Mexican restaurant, which is right next door to the Gentleman's Club and is still open today. I also called that business and asked for the owner. They told me he was not available. Now, I'll admit, I have called multiple phone numbers that I believe are Vinny Ocean asking him to speak to me. 
and I didn't get anything. Vinny Ocean is still around. He is in his late 70s uh, and is living under a new name. At this point, we know his name is Vincent Cabello. Um, he seems to still be living pretty well. I didn't harass him. I just asked him, uh, asked to speak to him, and I was hung up on. So I don't know if he's still in control of these businesses, but according to court filings, he is still on the names of these limited liability companies. Now, as I said, there are other companies as well, investment companies and things like that, that are public information. They're all state uh, businesses that are in the state database. Um, the car wash, everything that Vinny Ocean is involved with uh, is out there. Now, I will say as well, as I discussed earlier, there were tax liens and there is a home currently that Vinny Ocean's name is on. These are all, this is all public information that if you sift deep enough, you can find. So for all you people that tell me I don't do any research, that's pretty good research, isn't it? Vinny Ocean is a fascinating guy. Um, he's still around. There were rumors that he died, but he is not dead. He is still around. Um, now the question will be, why does Vinny Ocean not go on YouTube? And I think the answer is probably twofold. I just don't think he cares that much. I don't think he's worried. The people that were involved in that world. Weirdly enough, Missouri's still around. Obviously, I don't think he's going to do anything about it. Um, but Vinny Ocean is around. You can find his businesses. Now, what he does day to day with those businesses, from what I understand, according to the Outkick article about Vivid Gentlemen's Club, there is a person called Gino that is the manager. What and if Vinny Ocean has any decision making in this, I don't know, uh, but he's still around. I think he also probably just probably takes on the tact of like a Chris Pacciello or someone like that, where it's like, hey, I'm making money. I just don't really care to do that. I'm in my late 70s and I don't want to go on the internet. Um, but I'll tell Vinny Ocean this I got a lot of money with your name on it if you want to speak to me. Uh, publicly we can hide your face if you really want um you know as creators i've spoken to many people that we haven't heard from before you know so hey Vinny, if you want to speak i'd be glad to come down and interview you and you know, pay you some money and we'll have a good conversation uh so i guess let me know other than that that is that a wild life isn't it it really is so many different from the Fulton fish market to strip club owners to, you know, gay bosses. There's all sorts of fascinating things that not only Vinny Ocean was involved with, but the DeCalvacanti crime family was involved. But down the road, we'll do some other shows in the DeCalvacantis. They're an interesting, interesting group for sure. Um, as always, I appreciate all of you for listening. As uh, I always say, any likes, comments, participation you can give to the show means a whole lot to me, whether it's on audio or video. Um, and uh, yeah, that'll be that for this week. This has been episode 109 of the show. Go check out all our sponsors, including uh, FitBod. Get 25% off your subscription and download the app free, fitbod.me slash sit down. Any uh, helpful fitness goals you can achieve with them, you better thank me for it. I am Jeff Nadu. We will be back next week with another great episode. I believe we're going to do someone in the Lucchese crime family, which will be fun. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next week here on the show.